leaders are the ones looking for the stories that are emerging in their organization so they can get to the outcomes and the ending that they want. Listen in as we talk to business leaders who tell us about the blind spots, the stories that were emerging in their company and how they got to the ending that they want. I've always believed. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the new uh, episode of the Business Blind Spots Exposed podcast. I'm uh, Vinay Raman, and today I've got a uh, distinguished guest with me, Hal Coleman. Hal, how are you doing today? I'm doing just great, Vinay. How are you? I'm uh, I'm doing super. So a couple of housekeeping things here. Uh, I think maybe you saw a little bit of the intro. Uh, and I want you to know that this is an interactive and live podcast. Uh, Hal's been there and done that in the pest control industry for quite some time. And I don't want you to rely on the fact that I'm going to ask all the right questions. Uh, I'd like you to chime in throughout the course of this. There's a little chat box uh, or a comment box. Throughout the course of this, you can type in your questions and your comments and ask deeper questions. Ask us to go deeper and, and explain things further because this is all about exploration discovery and perspective. Let me do a little bit of uh, <laughs> telling you what's coming up in the next couple of weeks here, because I want to start to tell you a little more about how. So on September 7th, I've got Jody Wolkerling, who's going to come in and talk about the resilient organization and why does it matter? Organization change over time. And if you don't have resilience in the organization, you kind of hit these speed bumps and you skin your knee. Well, how do you become resilient so you don't skin your knee every time? That's, that's the point of that conversation. I think you'll find a lot of interesting uh, nuggets in there and insights. On August 31st, I've got Tracy Phillips. Your verbal communication says everything about you. People always talk about this idea of word choice. What words you have? Do I have to go pick up my kids or should I go pick up my kids or do I want to pick up my kids? It's all about the intent that comes across and the message that's received in the other side. Another fantastic episode coming up on August 31st. On the 26th, I've got Cindy Foy Euler. She's going to talk about what I've learned in 20 years of operations. She's been there and done that as far as running operational organizations, small, medium, and large. And she's going to tell you what 20 years has kind of taught her. Maybe it might be a couple of perspectives and viewpoints that you can uh, pick up along the way. But that brings us to today, right? I've got Hal Coleman, and the topic of our conversation is employees getting their heart in the game. And... The rest of this episode, I want to be talking to Hal about that and what he's done. And we're going to give you some specific examples that you can dig into. But I want to introduce you to, to Hal. So uh, I've got my notes here in front of me. Hal graduated from University of Georgia in 1974 with a degree in entomology, but he's been in pest control for 47 years. So Hal, I might say you might have a lot of the theory, but you've also kind of <laughs> skinned your knuckles and bruised your elbows, kind of kind of doing that as well, right? And, well, you uh, know, I, I got into the industry when I was three years old. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, uh, and you're still celebrating your, your 28th yeah. birthday, right? <laughs> well, I tell people there's no hole that you can crawl into uh, that I haven't crawled into. There's nothing you can be stung by that I haven't been stung by. There's no... Nothing you can get all over you that I haven't had all over me. So <laughs> been been there and done that. Been there and done that a couple of times. Uh, let's see. Uh, state Pest Control Regulatory Inspector, six years in sales and service for arrow exterminators in Atlanta, eight year, 18 years as owner and operator of his own pest control business. So you've kind of been there from the technician role all the way up to senior leadership and management, right? Uh, past uh, president of the Georgia Pest Control Association, founding member of uh, the Pest Control Association's Train the Trainer program. Uh, you sold your business in 2007, became a full-time marketing consultant, business coach, and sales trainer. So you started to shift from uh, all the experiences and gaining more experiences to saying, hey, look, here's a cut, couple of cuts, bruises, and scars, and band-aids that I've put on in the past. Let me show you how you may, might think of things from a different perspective. Um, talk hundreds of PCOs, managers, sales uh, people, technicians, uh, how to get more referrals, new customers by becoming better at their marketing, the communication, the way they understand who's on the other side of the conversation. Because 
I think empathy plays a huge role in all that we do and making sure that you understand who you're talking to makes a lot of difference. All right. But, but the thing I wanted to talk about today, uh, Hal, is employees. No organization is of any value without having good employees. Uh, is that is that is that a true statement in your under estimation? <laughs> well, except for the one man operator. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, and, go ahead, please. And 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 the the more employees you get, the more you envy the one man operator. <laughs> wow, that's a that's a true statement. I remember when I used to be at uh, you know in a technical role myself. I, I used to think my job was 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 just absolute crap because I always had to list take orders from someone else and they told me where to go. Then when I started to have 185 people reporting up through through the chain to me, I started going, gosh, I wish I was a single person and someone would just tell me what to do. <laughs> yes. Yes. But employees, right? We we made the topic of this conversation uh getting employees heart in the game. Unpack that for me. Why why does that matter? Well it matters uh you know, but I, I, I talk with my clients when it comes to hiring their first employee and building their businesses. Most, most of the people who get in my coaching program have less than 10 employees. Some, some have none at the time, but, but I, uh, I tell them you need to, you need to manage and operate your small business the same way you would as if it was a professional sports team. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you look at winning teams, there's a there's the morale is high. Uh, you know they're jumping up and down when somebody gets a, a, a crosses home plate. The other members are out there to pat them on the butt and pat them on the back, and and the managers are on the field fighting for them and getting thrown out of the game sometimes. And and it's just this spirit and this positive mental attitude that feeds from one individual to another. And, and, and if you look at teams that lose, they're having a losing season. You don't see a lot of smiles. You see a lot of frustration. You see a lot of arguments. I've even seen uh, two players on the same team get in a fight during an inning (laughs) on TV. They're on the same team for Christ's sake, you know? So, so uh, it's a, it, it starts at the top, but just as a as a as a as a professional sports team, even though they have a full team on the field uh, and they've got a strong bench or a strong dugout, the one thing that they do year round, twelve months out of the year, nonstop, is they recruit, looking for players not only who have the physical talents to meet the to meet the job and 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 the position, but who have the mental attitude that they're going to bring into the locker room. We've seen some great athletes uh, who are phenomenal. Uh, one comes to mind who played for the Atlanta Braves, where I'm from, a few years back, named John Rocker, who was a left-handed dominant left-handed pitcher in the league, and we got him, but he was a you know what. Uh, <laughs> off the field and and got himself in a lot of trouble and bad press by making comments about people. And his career really went down the tubes. He left Atlanta, went to some other teams. Nobody could get along with him. Nobody liked him because of his attitude. So uh, it all begins long before you hire somebody. Uh, I, I love these sports analogies i you know growing up playing individual and team sports myself uh so many of these things resonate i mean one of the things that someone told me about competition is when you go run in a race i mean i used to run track and field these 400 meter dash was my was my that that was my gig uh i did that well i'm not really running against others i was running against myself but once i started to get into relays where i was doing four by 100s or 200s those, those kind of relays yeah it really is about how the team carries and the and, and the and the culture and the interaction between people that matter. And if our heart's not in the right place, we're not all, all heading in the right direction. You know, a flubbed um, handoff of the baton, yeah, fireworks start because we're not all saying, "Hey, let's improve each other." 
Yeah. Is that, yeah. Does that resonate with you? It absolutely does. It absolutely does. And and here again, going back to, you know, once you hire somebody, it's it's kind of over with uh, at, to, at a point you've you've put this person on the team now. And a lot of people hire. They don't recruit until they need somebody. Let's use pest control, for example. You never know. Uh, you never know when you're going to get the phone call that your best technician had a heart attack last night, or you get the call and, and somebody says, my wife or, or my husband just got transferred to across the country and, and they're the main breadwinner and I have to go. Yeah. So you don't know, uh, to me, every employee that you have, their replacement should be one phone call away at all times. Just like that team. If the left-handed pitcher gets hit in the face with a baseball and uh, the, the manager picks up the phone, you know, and says, send Johnson here. He's, he's pitching tonight. And Johnson gets on the plane. So having people that you have already pre-interviewed, you've already had a face-to-face -face interview with them, and they believe in your culture and your uh, system and your organization, and they want to go to work for you. And they're willing to wait. They're willing to stay in, stay in the position that they have until you're ready to make that call. Uh, and, and when you don't do that and an, and an employee goes down or disappears and all of a sudden tomorrow we've got a whole route scheduled for this person, who's going to run that route? Now the, the manager or the owner finds themselves in, the posi in a, a freaked out position of they see money going down the tubes, they panic, and they hire the first somebody because they need some body to fill this position. And when that happens, 90% of the time, they hire the wrong person. So here, here's a lot of thoughts that are going through my head and kind of as you're saying that it's making sense to me. And I'm starting to think about how this kind of shifts the dynamic in the company, right? If, and this doesn't have to be something that's threatening to anybody. You know, if you've got 10 techs, right? This doesn't have to be something where you say, I've got, you know, seven people sitting on the bench here who I've had a conversation with. It's not about saying, hey, they're going to take your job so much as, hey, look, we've got bench strength. Whenever we need to reach down to the farm team and, and pull somebody up, we, we can do that, right? right. right. It, it's not about threatening them. It's saying we've got capacity as a company to grow, right? Right. Now, by the same token, it also puts a little bit of, I think there's always got to be a little bit of press for everybody. There's always got to be a little bit of stress. There's good stress and bad, right? There's got to be a little bit of good stress where, hey, if you don't show up to the job tomorrow, do you remember that there's a bet that we've got some bench strength and you do that twice. Hey, Jack, thanks so much for uh, for your time and your services. I, I, I just don't think this is a good fit for us. It puts a little bit of press on that person to kind of show up for the role. Is that not? It's a little bit of pressure on that person that the players play mm -hmm. harder when they see a lot of people sitting on the bench waiting to get in the game. Yeah, and, right. and and listen, when you have a strong bench as a business owner, it takes a tremendous amount of pressure off of you. Oh, yeah. You know, when I when I owned my pest control business and I was growing it back years ago, I told somebody I would put up with an employee. I would try to work with them. I'm sure they would put up with me. I would work with them. I would struggle. And 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 one day. I would make the decision in my mind, this person has to go. And it would take me another two years to let him go. Because I didn't have any, I didn't have anybody to replace him with. It's like the person who lives with an abscessed tooth or the person who remains in a bad marriage for years and years because the alternative is dealing with the separation and the replacement. So we, at just as, as that couple does, as business owners, we become comfortable being uncomfortable. We may be in pain, we may be in stress, but we know what tomorrow's going to bring. And so the employees are the same way. 
they will put up a, in a bad workplace and they will tolerate bad management and, and uh, disrespect and disloyalty because they say, well, you know, uh, at least I'm going to have a paycheck at the end of the week. So, yeah. so it's a, it's a two way street. See, this, this, this is a two edged sword. And, yeah, and right. when I, when I uh, go out and visit companies sometimes and speak to their employees and, and with the owner there and management there, I tell them in front of me, I, I look at, at the employees and I say, your job is, is to help this business owner is to do everything in your power to help this business owner reach his goals. And your job as a business owner is to do everything in your power to help these people reach their goals. That's right. And so it's very important with employees to me to, to, to know what those goals are. I just recommended to a client a couple of days ago, I said, you need to sit down behind closed doors and have a 30 minute meeting with each employee you have right now. He had never done that. And I said, Tell them you're just there to find out where they see themselves in a year or five years and what can you do to help them reach those goals and what suggestions do they have that would make your operation run smoother and make it be a win-win for both of you. When you do that, the employees are like, well, now that you bring it up, uh, yeah, I do have some good ideas. And you just find out things that you just never would have dreamed of behind closed doors. And then the, the employees begin to feel like, well, I'm a part of this thing. Yeah. I, I have some say so here and I have the potential to really move things in a good direction for myself. So I, I mean, I think everyone knows the company Apple, right? They've done quite well and they're, they had this mercurial, you know, one of a kind person, whether you love him or hate him, Steve Jobs did something right. Oh, he did. <laughs> right? Yes, he did. And, and I remember one of the quotes that he said uh, that I that I've, I'm not necessarily a general fan of Steve Jobs because there's some things that I think he could have done a little differently. But he does. There's a lot of value to what he's done. One of those quotes that he uses: "I don't hire smart people so I can tell them what to do. I hire smart people so they can tell me what to do." Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yes. And, and, and there's absolute genius in that statement, I believe. Yeah. You're familiar with Kinko's. Mm -hmm. And I, are they still in business? No, uh, they're part of FedEx now, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, do you know how they got the name Kinko's? I don't. Well, the guy that owns it in college uh, was a, a redheaded kid with with kink, kinky red hair that just was out like a dandelion, you know. Okay. And so his nickname was Kinko. Hmm. And he was, uh, I think he was like dyslexic. And in college, uh, he was, he would, uh, when you had to go down to the corner and make copies uh, from the little corner store that had a copy machine in there, he, he would get people to do his, do work on projects and do term papers. And he would, he would volunteer to go run down to the corner and do all their copies for them if they would do his research work for him. So all of a sudden he's got all of these people doing his work and he's making copies and waiting in line for copies. So uh, his, I don't know if his dad or who loaned him the money to buy a copy machine and he rented a little vacant office space and starts making copies. Next thing you know, he's got to buy another one. And next thing you know, with this college, he's just, so that's how he got in the business. Huh. But somebody interviewed him one time and said, what's the secret to the success of Kinko's? You've just taken off. What's your secret? He said, he said, I hire smart people. I pay them a lot more than they're worth and I get out of their way. That's, uh, it's really interesting. In my, in my company, I have this, um, I have this rule. I call it the rule of eight. And here, here's just the general idea, you know, if I can manage eight people, that's generally, you know, there's lots of management statistics studies that say, you know, one manager can manage eight, six to eight people pretty, pretty well. I'll just take eight as my number. Okay. But if you take eight and you raise it to the power of one, that's eight. But if you raise it to the power of two, that's 64. So if I have another layer of people, I manage eight people, they manage eight people, that's 64. 
eight to the fourth power. So there's four levels of management in there. That's 4,096 people, right? So my goal as a leader is to get to where I have four layers of leadership, right? I got 4,096 people. So everybody walking in the door, I tell them, I want you to build a vision for your rule of eight. How are you going to get eight people working for you, right? And what that starts getting them to do is to start thinking for themselves, well, I can't keep doing this because if I keep doing this, I'll never have eight people working for me. So how do I automate this task or how do I make this streamline this task? so that I can hand it off because I want to go to Vinaya and get people to work for me sooner rather than later. Great. Let, let them keep solving the problems for me and saying, hey, Vinaya, so this is what I got to do next. I'm glad you suggested that idea. I never even saw it. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I call it the rule of eight, which I think yeah. is very, it's very rule. Rule what you're saying there. So. It's a great rule. Um, so one of the things I wanted to do here uh, is – as we start talking about employees and getting the heart in the game, we start to, I mean, what you've been talking about, this idea is as a leader, you start to get them to start. Well, the way I think about it is if I get their heart in the game, I don't have to pull them along. They start pulling me along. Right? I start saying, hey, we want to get to the top of Mount Everest. I start scratching my head saying, what kind of boots should we wear? I mean, how much, I mean, what kind of backpacks do we need? I mean, how much food do we need? You know, how long does, I don't know any of that stuff, Right. Somebody else knows about boots. They know about food. They know about campfires on, on you know, 10,000 feet up. They know that stuff. I don't. So if I start asking them the question about how they can contribute, whether it's technical, management, process, procedure, whatever else it is, they start telling me I can get to the top of Mount Everest faster. Is that, does that resonate well with you? Yes, it, it does. It does. And so... If, if we can get people's heart into the game, we get them to understand the objective that we're trying to get to as a company, I can enlist their help and they start moving faster than me and say, say hey, Vinay, come along. <laughs> Let's, we got to move faster if we're going to make it there in two weeks. Right, right. And one of the problems that, that managers and, and business owners face is we hire people, especially in sales. This seems to be more prevalent in sales. We hire people in sales and we tell them to go out and sell. But we don't know how to sell. Mm -hmm. So we're sending people, we're giving them the boots and the equipment and the air packs and everything else. And we're saying, now go climb to the top of Mount Everest. But we've never been up on Mount Everest. So it's very easy for them to become frustrated and say, well, if you if you think it's so easy to get to Mount Everest, let's see you climb part of the way up. So the best thing that we can do as a, as a owner or manager is to strap on the boots and get everybody strapped up and say, OK, y'all ready to go? Follow me. And you climb a little ways up there and you, you see how you do this now? You see how you do it? Okay, just keep on going. And then you can go back to the rear. At, but, but showing them how to do something is so... I remember the best boss I ever had was when I was in college. I worked every summer at Atlanta Country Club on the golf course, on the golf course maintenance. It was hard physical work and it was out in the hot sun. I was about 18 years old and we had a guy named, named Bill and I don't really remember Bill's last name. But Bill would come along with a little dump truck and load about five of us college guys up on there with shovels. And he would go, he said, we, we got to dig a water line from here to that flag down there. And he would jump down into the ditch and start digging with a pick and a shovel. And he would dig a couple of feet of that thing and throw it. He said, now you see what I'm doing? You see how I do this? This is what I want you to do. And then he would get out, hand us a shovel, and we would all jump in there, start digging, and he would leave and go somewhere else. And and my feeling was at the time, as as the others were, you know, Bill can do it, I can do it. Bill, Bill I'm not going to go back and, and and whine and say, why, well, hey, you ought to get in there and try this, okay? If you think it's so easy, it can't be dug that way. Well, you can't do that because Bill's already got in there and showed you how to dig. it, And now he doesn't have to worry about you coming, whining back and saying, if you think this is such a good idea, 
why don't you get in there and try digging a little bit of it? Yeah. So, so showing people, uh, I, 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 I talk to people about, they say about door to door selling. And I, I tell the manager, I say, let me teach you how to do it. You go out there and do it. And you take your guys out there and show them how to do it. And then you can say, good luck guys. Let me know if you have any problems. They have a tremendous amount of respect for you at that point because they realize you're not asking them to do anything that they can't do themselves. Right. Uh, or that you can't do yourself rather. So, so that, that's my favorite way of, of, of was of leading is to let me show you that I can do this myself and I'll show you how to do it. And then you can do it. So we, we, we're, we're guilty of, asking people to go out and do things that that we we aren't willing to do sometimes yeah i uh i agree with that i have a book here on my shelf called uh, hyper sales growth and it and it talk gives us example of a basketball team it talks about princeton basketball in this example and it says princeton basketball doesn't go out to, to the game and say all right guys so here's a couple of plays i'd like to introduce you to you I want you to give this a shot. No, that's not what they do. They work their tails off. They run up and down the courts. They try these plays exhaustively. They get them to memorize all the plays and all that stuff before they get to the game, right? right. So it becomes muscle memory, right? So this whole idea is not only if I show you how to do it, we're going to do it. We're going to practice it. We're going to go through. It's not on the job training. That's what this guy says. On the job training is kind of a, kind of a waste of your time, a waste of an employee's time, right? Walk through it. Let's say, what are we going to do here? Let's do some role playing. Let's practice these drills. Let's practice these uh, these formations before we get out there. So the idea is, hey, let's walk up this hill a little bit here together. And if we walk up this hill together, you guys kind of, is the light bulb starting to go off in your head as to what, because, and you'll start to see that by the questions that they start asking. They start asking the right questions. You're like, okay, the light bulb is bright in their head. That's right. Why don't you, why don't you go off and do, right? Yeah. And, and. It's very important to have uh, some type of job description. Yeah. That because you, you you the employee needs needs to know coming onto the team what's expected, exactly what's expected, and and I uh, I hear a lot of times you, or or did you know I, I need you guys to go out and start visiting some real estate companies or whatever and you would hear well look i wasn't hired to do that yeah i was hired to do this and now they feel like you're changing the game so if you you and you should be changing the game from time to time you know if you're doing the same thing if you're static you're just you're backing up so but in the job description in the very beginning they need to understand that uh you'll be, this is your main job, but we're evolving. So we'll be asking you to do other things, whatever management asks you to do. Uh, that's part of your job description. We'll be training you to do new things, going in different directions. And uh, so we, we hire people to do one thing and then we come in later and change the game. And, and they weren't aware that that was a possibility. And that creates frustration also. So I want to take a, a quick moment here and, and, and pause because uh, part of the challenge with uh, live streaming is I don't actually know at the time how many people are listening in. So uh, if there are people who are listening in, I'd love to hear where you're connecting in from, what maybe what company. Uh, just tell us who you are and where, 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 where you are. That would be great. And I'd love to hear what you've heard. I've, I've gotten a couple of what I'll call the blind spots that I've picked up along the way here, right? Um, and the idea that sports teams are constantly recruiting and the idea is that you need to hire people beforehand so you can create the culture that you want. I'd love to hear what you're hearing from Hal and what uh, takeaways that you've got. Please, uh, in the comment box, type them in. I'd love to hear what you, who you are, where you're from, and what have you heard so far? And the reason I wanted to pause is because I want to transition a little bit here. We talked about this idea of getting employees' hearts into the game. You know, one of the things that we do as a company is uh, I, I call it empathizing the data. There's so much information. There's so much data. You've got routes. You've got, you know, how many stops do they make? Do they go fast? Do they go slow? All that stuff is inform information. 
But how do you translate that into changing how you speak to that employee, right? How do you embrace that employee? And Hal, I, w- I wanted to bring up a couple of um, examples of people, right? What's happening with them based on real data? And how would you start to talk as a leader to them? What, what do you see? What is the story that's going on in your head? And how would you talk to them? Is that okay if we uh, switch over there and take a look at a couple of those things? Yes. And if I don't know the truth, I'll make it up. <laughs> Fair enough. And, <laughs> and I, think this, I think this is the point, right? Lots of times is I don't think as a leader, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, uh, I'm the first in line and I don't know the I don't know line. But I think that's the point here, right? Is to come yeah. away with some takeaways from, uh, from what you can do with some of these graphs. So I'm going to, and Miguel, hey, uh, Miguel Marquez from Pest Solutions Termite and Pest Control Southgate. Thanks for uh, chiming in. Uh, I, I would love to hear some of your comments as we go through this. So I'm going to share my screen here and show you, introduce you to a profile of an employee and how, get some ideas from Hal. All right here. So you'll see on screen here, this is a worker called Pat. I've, I, I, I think of Pat as a frustrated worker, Hal. He's been a technician for two years, and here's some facts about Pat, and I'm going to give you his graph in a second here. He's, he's got some good driver behaviors. He's got some low productivity, but he's got a history of being good. I think we're starting to see a little bit of a story with Pat here already. And this is uh, our performance intelligence uh, behavior graph, right? So the idea is that if uh, the blue represents Pat's story, right, actual stops made, he is fantastic. He is doing as good as he could as anybody else in the company. His production per hour, he's doing a little bit better than average. That's what this black line represents. His production per mile, uh, on the higher side. The safe acceleration, the red line says not not so good, but his safe braking is about average. How what kind of story comes up for you here in terms of what's happening with Pat? What as a leader, what do you what are you seeing here? Well, Sometimes when you hire an employee, they, I, I, I heard this, I heard this statement made one time in a company I worked for that uh, uh, when they start paying me more, I'll do more. Mm-hmm. And uh, the employer, of course, attitude is when you start doing more, I'll pay you more. <laughs> So there, there, there are Napoleon Hill wrote in, in the book, Think and Grow Rich, about what they call the extra mile formula. And it goes right along with what Ralph Waldo Emerson said about compensation. If, you have, if you've never read his essay on compensation uh, as an employer or a manager, you should read it. His essay on compensation that for every, every, action so to speak there's a justified reaction so so for an employee uh it's uh if if you there are there are three things napoleon hill talks about the uh the amount of work done the quality of work done and the mental attitude with which it is done and those, and he called it QA plus Q2 plus MA equals C, and C stands for compensation. So if you do a, a tremendous amount of production, and the production that you do is quality production, and you do it with a positive mental attitude, your compensation will be through the roof. Compensation meaning not only financial, but but uh, uh, positive mental attitude, financially rewarded uh, promotions within a company. You'll always be moving up and forward if you if you understand and apply the the uh, extra mile formula. But maybe you do a tremendous amount a quantity of work you outproduce everybody Mm -hmm. and the quality of your work is great but you have a poor mental attitude 
Now you're back to John Rocker, the pitcher I talked about. Your compensation is going to be, you're going to be passed over. Yeah. You're, or you're going to be pushed aside at some point. Now, maybe you have a great positive mental attitude uh, and the quality of your work is just superb, but you just can't do very much of it. So, and, and so, so one of those three things is missing. And when one of those three things is missing, the compensation on the other end is going to ref, be reflected. And one of the stools of one of the legs of the stool is missing. Does that make sense? It does. And, and what I like about this is that you can kind of take a look at this and you start to see that there's some gaps in what, how Pat is showing up at the company, right? There's an opportunity to say, Hey, look, Pat, we want to go to the top of this mountain. And I, I really love to have you along for the ride. And part of that, that group that makes it to the top of the mountain. But I don't, right now, I'm not seeing you on that journey, just the way things are showing up. How can I get you there, right? It can shift how you have that conversation with Pat, where he gets to say, well, I want to be there. What's holding you back right now, Pat? Well, um, I don't get good reps. I mean, it, it could be lots of different things, right? But yeah. now you get to lean into it and see, well, here's here's what I need you to do in order to get there, right? Is that is that is that fair? Yes, that's fair. Here's what I need you to do, or or not so much what I need you to do. I'm I always believe in making it about the other position. Hey, what is you not need what I do. need you to do. This is what you need to do. Yeah. Because this is about you. This is not about me. Okay. Yeah. So this is what you need to do to get there. Now so, they won't always they won't always do that because there's so many external factors. Like you say, that uh, the person could have a physical problem such as low blood sugar or something that 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 saps their energy. They could have uh, uh, they could be involved just in a horrible relationship at home that has them preoccupied. They could suffer from depression, either circumstantial depression or clinical depression. So. We don't know. We don't know why. So just because we we point out doesn't mean that they're going to take action there. So this is a slippery slope, you see. I, I, and I love that because now it gives you a chance to elicit that out and find out what's 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 blocking them from uh, from things happening. I want to shift to. Uh, I'm going to pick someone else here, right? Because I'd like to just give a couple of different examples of kind of how you can look at these things and start to see there's different dynamics with each employee. Each employee has different, uh, different things to work within, right. And different ways to work with them. So I'm saying here's Sam, right. I, I need some support technician. He's been around for four years. He's a good driver behavior, but low productivity also had a history of being good. Look, this is, this is how he shows up, right. Completely different way, same role, different person, kind of shows up a different way. What keeps this person from becoming a superhero in the company is different, right? Actual stops made, eh, he's better than average, right? Production per hour, really low. Production per mile, really low. Safe acceleration, not so good. He's doing average here. How how do you see this, Hal, as this employee, and how do we steer them to get their heart in the game? Well, here again, it, it's it's kind of the same the same thing. It's it's uh, there. There may be there may be external issues going on outside the office that you don't know about, and and that you have no control over. And some of them they have no control over either. But but they're also this is another great. Both of these are examples of times when you should say, uh, when you get a chance, I, I I need to schedule a time with you for a, for a, a meeting just with me behind closed doors, yeah, and and sit down and one on one, and let's talk. And you know, this is not going any further than this room, but I need to know what's going on with you here because you're doing, all, always praise them first. Yeah, you you're doing great here. You're doing great here, but but here. In this third area, uh, your your work is not up to it's not up to the baseline, yep. and we have to find a way to improve this. And and, and so uh, you know, find out what's really going on there. 
But another part of it with all of these, the, the, you know, the, this is the cold part that, that people don't like to talk about, but there has to be, uh, there has to be accountability also for if you point out something that they need to be doing, yeah. uh, is this something, and in most cases, we make suggestions to people as to what they should be doing rather than letting them know you're required to do this. Yeah. And we do everything we can to help them uh, meet that parameter. But if they don't, if they fail to do it, now this is a whole nother problem. So now we have to deal with that. Do you let them continue to perform uh, in a substandard or an unacceptable way, or do you trade them to another team and bring and make that phone call and bring in a new player? And what I think this allows you to do is to have an objective and, un, and unbiased conversation, right? It gets you to say, hey, look, this is the standard I'm holding you to. Here's the bar that I want you to meet. This is where you are. Yeah. Help me, help me understand what's, what's going on, right? How can, I help, how can I help you get there? That's you right. tell me how I can help you get there. Let me uh, let me bring up someone else, maybe not so uh, a, a, di a little slightly different profile here, right? So I, I call this guy the hidden superhero. I'd love to see if you kind of arrive at the same conclusion. Uh, high production per hour, safe acceleration, but he's low on customer stops, right? So here's a here's a little bit of data on this guy, right? Dan. So oops, made this a little little large here. Um, Actual stops made really low, production per hour oh off the chart. Production per mile doing really well. Safe acceleration, fabulous. Safe breaking not so much. You know, I think we've got an employee here who's actually got a cushy route. Right? They got they got that commercial uh, that multi multifamily unit where they've got <laughs> eighteen stops in one building, and and he just kind of phoned it in. He's finishing at two o'clock every day. And there's probably more more capability in this person, but they're just kind of phoning it in because they don't really have to work hard. Do, do you see that too? And there's yes. an opportunity here. I do Is see that... it. I do see it. There are several reasons. This person could just be uh, like me. They could be an, an, an unstoppable talker. <laughs> and on every stop, they can't just do the work and get back in the truck, but they got to talk and talk about the vacations. And next thing you know, uh, uh, there are a lot of reasons, but generally when I see this, the, the issue is time management. Yeah. And, uh, this is, uh, time management is such a beast and, and it gets ignored by so many, so many people, you know, if you, if you, uh, I tell my guys who have employees this, I say, I'll tell you this little analogy, but make sure you have a, a tissue or a crying towel. <laughs> but if, if you have an employee that wastes one hour a day. Now, I confess I waste time. I'm sure you would confess that you waste. But if you're if, if somebody's on your payroll and you're paying them to work from eight to five, and they simply waste one hour a day. Maybe that's just talking to uh, clients on the job. Maybe it's surfing the internet. Maybe it's it's taking, you know, uh, uh, six, 10 minute smoke breaks outside. I don't know, but if they waste one hour a day, and let's say you work a 40 hour week, okay? There's an average of 250 work days in a year. Yeah. So if you waste one hour a day, that's 250 hours. Now, based on a 40 hour work week, you're paying them for six and a half weeks that they did absolutely nothing. Yeah. That's, that's just it. staggering to me. That's a so, huge number. So uh, when I see that, that, that the, the work is great, they don't get any complaints, everybody loves them, they turn in there, but they don't make enough stops. They're just not uh, visiting enough accounts. They're not making enough phone calls. It, it's just, a, to me, it's a time management thing. 
And for anybody who's listening in, if you'd like me to send you some of these graphs so you can take a look at your own leisure, just type in profile into the comments and I'll, and I'll, and I'll send them over to you afterwards. I, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to stop, uh, because I, uh, I think people are more interesting than, uh, than, than, uh, the, the images. I, so, you know, looking through some of those, those graphs, right. You start to understand the stories. I think this is really the key point, right? As a leader, I've started to realize that if I want to get people's heart in the game, I got to understand their individual story. I, gone are the days where I can just say, here's, you know, the beatings will continue until morale <laughs> improves. Back in Egyptian days, I think that worked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. No longer, right? You got to understand each one of them. You got to understand what Dan or Pat or, you know, Sam, what they need and support them, just like the coach does for for each one of their sports players, right? They got to show up for them when they get into a brawl and say, come on, buddy, let me uh, let me get you back on the right path. Am I, am I saying something of value there? Yes, yes, absolutely. And, you know, the, uh, uh, the one thing that's most important once you recruit, once you have the interview, uh, and once you decide on hiring, the, the most important thing that gets neglected so often is – you need to know what motivates that individual. And with a lot of people, it's money. With some, it's not money. It's having a sense of, of belonging and a sense of importance, a sense of being an integral part of this machine. Now, I had a, uh, when I had employees, it was time for them to be evaluated for an annual raise you know, and they all want to know how much money they're going to get. Well, I had one employee who worked in the office and I said, you know, you're, you're up for a raise this year. How, how do you like that? You're going to get a raise. She said, well, I don't know that I want a raise. <laughs> I'm like, really? She said, yes. What I would like to do is negotiate with you. And I said, in what way? She said, rather than a raise, I would like to get off at 12 o'clock on Fridays. Huh. And I said, I think we can work that out. So we worked it out. Uh, the next year she had, you know, she really worked hard. She had a lot of respect. But the next year when she was up for a raise, guess what she wanted? The whole day off on Friday instead of a pay raise. And I gave her that. Then the next year, I said, I can't do that anymore, but pretty soon you'll be off all week and I'll just be paying you your salary. <laughs> but, but see, time with her family and time off was much more important to her than money. Yeah. And I've had, but, but that's not true with everybody. But knowing what motivates them, because everybody's not the same. Every employee's not the same. Some employees aren't worth near as much as other employees are. And therefore, they don't, you know, there's all this fuzzy stuff about to treat everybody the same. They're all equals. You know, well, they're not all equals. I heard Jimmy Johnson when he was coaching the, uh, after he had coached the uh, Dallas Cowboys, to, I think the first Super Bowl, talking about players. He said, I don't treat all players the same because they're not all the same. He said, if, if Lawrence Taylor falls asleep during a team meeting, I have an assistant coach go stand by his chair to make sure he doesn't fall out of the chair and hurt himself. He says, if a second string lineman who missed two tackles last Sunday falls asleep in a team meeting, he wakes up traded to Baltimore. Yeah. And so you, you have to just, you have to be able to look at each employee through a, through a, a, a tube, a telescope, so to speak, and find out you've got to know everything about this employee so that you know how to work them into the team. And you can't expect them to be exactly like everybody else because they're not like everybody else. They don't react like everybody else. They don't respond like everybody else. And so this is a juggling act for a manager or an owner. Uh, and it's never ending. It's it's never ending. I I you know it, that's really interesting, Hal, and, and 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 I think there's a there's a, a second sentence to that statement. You know, each one of them are different. Is you've got to hold them to a, a similar standard, though, right? Yeah. To be a, right, and that's where I, I love this idea of being. I mean, with my kids, I've got three kids, 
and they all they all come to me at different times and they're like dad i'm your favorite i was like you're my favorite one of you you are <laughs> that's right <laughs> i i do not love you like your like your brother or your sister because they're different and i love them in a completely different way and my love does not divide in threes right it's not 30% 30, 33% 33% it's 100 it's 100 100 that's it right uh, and, but when I tell you, Hey, it's time to come inside from playing outside and it's time to come in for dinner. I'm not saying it's 25 minutes for you and eight minutes for you. I'm saying it's, I need you to come inside in five minutes <laughs> for all of you. Right. And holding them accountable to that standard, using some of those data and some of those graphs and stuff. I think that's where you get the opportunity to say to them, look, I, I got you in as a tech and I have a standard that I'm going to hold you to. How can I help you get to that standard, because that's what my job is in this company. Am I, am I saying that right? How can I help you? The, the magic phrase, how can I help you? How can I help you be successful here? Miguel, and, and let me, I want to kind of chime in for a second here with Miguel. Miguel, I, you, you, you've kind of chimed in here, and if there's any others who are listening in, uh, I'm kind of curious how all of this is resonating with you, uh, because Hal's been saying, I, I think, dropping a lot of great nuggets here. I'm kind of curious which ones are standing out for you, which ones you feel like you could take home uh, and do something with today. So please uh, type that into the comments. I'd, I'd love to hear that. I think Hal would love to love to see which resonates. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, but, absolutely. But, but please uh, keep keep going, Hal. I, I kind of jumped in there and interrupted you. Oh no, that's okay. I'm I'm uh, uh, like I told you before. I'm I'm severely ADD. You know, when I was in school, in elementary school, attention deficit disorder, that term hadn't been coined. So ADD stood for ain't done diddly this year. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of me. You know, I was just always bouncing off of the walls. And uh, and I tend to do that sometimes when I, when I get in conversations like this. But, you know, uh, it's a, it's the, the, the big difference is, and I'm just, you know, just laying it out there being brutal. Business owners and employees belong to two different country clubs. Yeah. Just as in the military, you have the officer's club and you have the NCO club. Uh, as a business owner, your business is your life. With an employee, their job is an interruption in their life. When you, if you wake up at two, if you're laying in the bed at two o'clock in the morning because you can't sleep and you're a business owner, the odds are you're thinking about your business. That's right. That may be why you can't sleep. But I'll assure you, if you're an employee and you're laying awake at two o'clock in the morning, you're not thinking about your job. <laughs> no, you're not. And and when when you get up in the, on Monday morning to go to work as a business owner, you're going there to embrace your life but as an employee you're leaving your life to go to work and you're looking at your watch on the way to work imagining what time you're going to be to get back to your life yeah that's right so business owners make a bad mistake sometimes of thinking that an employee is going to automatically take ownership and 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 be, be, treat the business as if it was his or hers but that's not realistic because it's not his or hers and i tell people that, you know the only way you can generally get an employee to take ownership of something is to give us give them some ownership of it well, uh, and you can you can do that by shares or by commission not you do, it doesn't have to be literal ownership but they have to know that the sky is the limit for me here you know i can I want to make a point there because I think there's a great piece in there. And, and this is a saying that I use is I can pay people for their minds, but if I get their hearts, I win. Right. And what keeps you up at night as the owner is that your heart is invested in it. Right. Yes. And if you can make that shift as an organization, right. As a leader to get your people to say, Hey, look, I'm here to support you because you're a superstar. You're a genius in your own right. My job is to, you're, you're the diamond of the rough. My job is the jewelers to make sure I bring out the brightest diamond possible. Right. What can I do to get you there? Once they start saying, 
hey, this is all about me. I come into this company because I'm going to be successful because, you know, one day maybe I do want to hang out my own shingle. But you know what? I'm going to stick with this guy for the next 15 years because he just keeps taking me up to the next level. Absolutely. And, and if they're laying there in bed at two o'clock at night thinking about you and what you're allowing them to do in the organization, I think you can call that a day. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and you know, it's uh, – uh, here again, it begins in the it begins in the beginning. Yeah, you you have to. Uh, I I worked for our exterminators in uh, Atlanta for six years. I worked for them when they were doing a million dollars worth of business a year. Now I think they're up like three hundred sixty million. Same owners, uh, Joe Thomas, the guy that owned it, uh, still owns it great guy that was a mentor to me then. And still, even though I don't see him very often, he's still a mentor to me now because I think back, but even he, he came to work every day and executive, you know, had on a nice suit and tie and everything else. And, and the guys would be out there washing the truck, or rinsing the termiticide out of the back of the truck after doing a pre-treat, he would go over and talk to him. He knew, now, every employee he had, he knew their spouse's name and their children's names. And he would just come over to, hey, Bob, how's it going today? Oh, well, fine, Joe, I'm, I'm doing good. How's Mary and how's Bobby and Susie doing? You know, everybody and and, and everybody just like me, I would think he knows my family's names. He asked about them. Uh, he, he's he is generally uh, wants to know about me. It just made me feel so special and such a, uh, such a genuine part of that company. Felt like the guy at the very top, uh, speaks to me on the very bottom as if I'm his best friend. And, and that let me know that people are looking out for me here. Yeah. And there was an old saying there that, that we, use that sometimes they would that one of the managers would ask you to go do something after hours or on the weekends or something you didn't really want to go do and and to let you know you're going to be kind of said oh, look i need you to go to gainesville georgia and do this it's and you're thinking oh, i was on my way home I said don't worry i need you to go do this treatment here it is joe will take care of you and when they said joe will take care of you that meant it's going to be worth it for me to go up there and do that and you went up there with a smile on your face the whole way. Uh, and so uh, that just meant a lot. I learned so much from that organization. And uh, they've, they've, uh, they've never changed. They're just a, a, probably the best organization in the pest control industry to work for. So, Hal, we're, we're uh, just a couple moments out. And uh, Miguel, thank you for uh, chiming in. It says, great advice from both of you on identifying employees' wants and needs. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point. I, I, it's time for us to uh, get wrap up here. And I actually want to say, Miguel, thank you so much for being part of the conversation and listening in and, and chiming in. I hope this was a really good use of your, your hour of time. You got some take-home messages. Uh, yes, if anybody you. else. I'm sorry. I said, thank you, Miguel. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I appreciate you stepping forward. If there's anybody else who wants some of those graphs so they can take a look at it and see how they can start to read in stories, there's five of them that I'll, I can send across to you. Type pro profile in the chat box and I'll, I'll send those out to you soon after we're done here, as well as a link to this episode. It'll, it's live on YouTube, Facebook, and, <clears throat> and LinkedIn. So you'll be able to find it out there, but I'll send you those links soon after this. You can also subscribe to the podcast. You can kind of go back through and listen to some of these uh, nuggets. Uh, you know, I'm going to go back, back and read about the extra mile formula. Uh, I'm going to read about the essay and compensation from Ralph Waldo Emerson. I couldn't write fast enough. Um, <laughs> but uh, if you want to also, if you want to get in touch with uh, Hal, I'll be more than happy to put you in touch with Hal directly if you if you need to get con in contact with him. So sorry, but Hal, thank you, thank you for your time and sharing. Thank you, Vinay. It's been a lot of fun and. Uh... Let's do it again sometime. I, I, I appreciate I appreciate you saying that. I, I do look forward to that. Miguel says, finding it difficult to find sales employees at this time. I'm in the process of training two techs to be sales reps, and they are happy employees. Uh, 
I'd love to put you in touch with Hal because I think that's what what he does. Uh, so Miguel, after I reach out for you, maybe if uh, if that's okay, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll put you in touch. I'll, I'll sure. come check in with you. Absolutely. But Hal, thank you for your time. Thanks for sharing, uh, and for anybody else who listens in the future. Uh, hopefully, this is a good use of your time. And feel free to type into the comments, and we'll uh, we'll send you those uh, those graphs and help you uh, get your company to the next level. Thanks so much, Hal. We'll uh, we'll talk again soon. Thank you.